the security gap approaches to policing in conflict the hashtag for today's event is hashtag policing in conflict um, for uh, as some of you may know <laughs> USIP has a very rich history um, on working to improve policing in conflict affected uh, settings the Institute's research and policy engagements have contributed to a better understanding of how to establish and maintain security and rule of law in conflict affected countries and how to promote a holistic approach to policing and security sector governance. Our policing programs in the Sahel, Kenya, Pakistan, Tunisia and elsewhere are currently helping USIP to realize the potential of international policing assistance. Over the last year, USIP has decided to significantly re-energize its position as a central actor in the field of security sector governance. So we're happy to say that over the next two years, we plan to strengthen our capabilities to deliver timely, high-impact technical support to address strategic security sector governance challenges in key conflict-affected environments. So this is therefore the first of a series of events that we're planning on hosting at USIP in the field of security sector governance in the next few years. So we wanted to start this series with this event, uh, with an event that is focusing on policing and conflict uh, for a number of reasons. First, um, most of us have spent time in the field working as who have spent time in the field working in peace operations or as part of peace processes uh, have realized that once hostilities have died down um, there is another set of security challenges that tend to kick in uh, there is indeed a need to quickly re-establish basic security to allow humanitarian relief to flow to allow people to return home to allow children to go back to school and basic economic activity to resume. These are challenges for sure, but we also see them here at USIP as opportunities. Um, they present unique opportunities to start repairing um, the numerous broken social contracts in many communities. And we see police as a particularly important vector for repairing these social contracts because police are often the most common point of interaction of citizens with the state and as such, they provide crucial opportunities to reestablish the legitimacy of the state in the eyes of citizens at a key moment in time. The second reason we wanted to host this event today is that, and you will see this from our panelists in our discussion, um, and it will make it very clear. Um, from our perspective, while there is broad consensus and agreement that meeting these security needs uh, is, is crucial. What we know is that international experience over the last decades has illustrated how difficult it is to support the provision of effective policing in these situations. So we are in many ways at an important point of juncture today. If we look ahead, we know that there are a number of security challenges uh, that will be faced for, uh, by local populations in countries that are currently facing conflict. We can think of Ukraine. We can also think uh, of many countries in the Sahel region, for example. But we can also look back. And looking back, we have a unique opportunity to assess the challenges that were faced over the last decades in places such as Bosnia, Kosovo, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And more importantly, the lessons and insights that emerge from these various international efforts to support policing services in these settings. So for that reason, we've structured today's event into two main parts. During the first part, <coughs> what we want to do is we want to take a hard look and a candid look at the hard lessons that have emerged uh, from these efforts in Kosovo, Bosnia, as well as in Afghanistan. And then there, during the second part, um, we will be examining models uh, that have been developed in order to better address these challenges. Uh, so this is how we want to structure our discussions today, and we're very much looking forward to, to these discussions. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to our distinguished panelists. We're very lucky to be counting on uh, a, a very um, a good set of panelists today. And I wanted to start with uh, introducing Ambassador Lars uh, Gunnar Wiegermark, um, and we have the pleasure of welcoming him today online. 
Uh, Ambassador Vigramak is the head of mission for ULX Kosovo. He has been leading the ULX mission in Kosovo since 2019. Over his career, he served in a series of positions as a member of the Swedish Diplomatic Corps. He led recently the EU delegation mission to Bosnia and Herzegovina from 2015 until 2019. We're privileged today to benefit from his current first-hand experience with international policing challenges in Kosovo. I also want to welcome John Sokko back at USIP. John is the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, following over 30 years of experience in oversight and investigations as a prosecutor, congressional counsel, and senior federal government advisor. John has been a regular speaker at USIP for many years, and we're grateful to be able to benefit from his thoughtfulness once more today. We're also joined by Jaswant Lal, <clears throat> who is the officer in charge at the Strategic Policy and Development Section of the United Nations Department of Peace Operations Police Division. Jaswant joined the UN Police Division in 2008 after having served in the Fiji Police Force for 26 years. Last, I want to extend a particularly warm welcome to Colonel Giuseppe Di Magistris, um, who is the director of the NATO Stability Policing Center of Excellence. Over his 30 year, 30 plus year career with the Italian Carabinieri, he has served in numerous roles in Italy and overseas, including in Iraq, Afghanistan, Kosovo, and in Bosnia and Herzegovina and working with NATO and the United Nations. I want to thank him and his entire team at the NATO St Stability Policing Center of Excellence for helping <clears throat> to make today's conversation possible. It has been a pleasure to partner with him and his team, and we are very much looking forward to continuing to strengthen our partnership. So with this, I will ask all our panelists to come on stage so that we can start our discussions. And welcome, and thank you for joining us. So as we just mentioned, the let's jump right into the discussion. And first, what we wanted to do is to take the opportunity to look back and to focus our attention on uh, a number of concrete challenges that we faced um, in different contexts over the last few decades and take a hard look at the hard lessons that we've learned. And then we'll move on to discussing uh, about models that have been developed in order to better address these challenges. So what I wanted to do first is to turn to the context of Bosnia and Kosovo. The reason we wanted to do this is for many practitioners in this field, um, Bosnia and Kosovo was one of the first source of lessons that started emerging uh, when the international community uh, was, was focused on providing uh, international uh, policing assistance. And there are a number of concrete lessons that have emerged from these contexts. And we wanted to turn to Ambassador Vigomark in order to uh, have a sense of the lessons that have emerged uh, from Kosovo and Bosnia. Uh, and since he's currently the head of the EULEX mission in Kosovo, we thought that Ambassador Vigomark could um, provide a number of, of, of interesting insights on that front. So I wanted to start with Ambassador Vigomak. I don't know if he's able to join us online. Uh, if he's, I am here. Uh, Hi, I'm here. Good. Hello. Good to see you, and thanks for joining us. Good morning. Us good, morning good, good afternoon here in Kosovo and Pristina. <laughs> um, yeah, I was listening to part of your introduction, and in the meantime, I was also trying to <laughs> send some messages here on, on on Signal because we have an unfolding incident in in in. Um, in northern Kosovo as we speak, which um, involves our so-called foreign police unit there in a, in a monitoring role. They're monitoring the situation. There's a 
difficult. Speaking of gaps, security gaps, there's a real security vacuum right now in northern Kosovo. I don't know to what extent the other panelists are following this, but probably some of them are, uh, if they have experience from this region and similar, similar situation. Um, so uh, maybe I'll start there as, a, as an example. Um, we have had a presence here as EU, as so called the EU Rule of Law Mission since 2008, nine, when we took over the rule of law mandate from, from the UN, from UNMIC. And uh, in the early days of this mission, we had a very large presence of police officers here with four or five so-called foreign police units. Um, at the beginning, I think there were up to 1,600 police officers. Now we're down to uh, our regular foreign police unit, which is all Polish, 105. Uh, we just um, uh, deployed a, a small reserve of Carabinieri and a handful of Lithuanian special police in, uh, in, in early November, on November 8th. Uh, we could actually use some more here. We're going through something called the European Gendarmerie Force, um, which is a kind of coordination mechanism for seven EU member states that have Gendarmerie type of, of police. And we had some of this reserve here earlier this year um, from, from France and, and uh, Portugal, uh, when we also had a tense situation around uh, elections in Serbia and whether they could be held or not in, in Kosovo. In early April, in the end, they were not held here in Kosovo for the first time in Kosovo's brief history. And right now, it's also about elections, actually, because uh, all the mayors in, northern, in the four northern predominantly Serbian uh, municipalities, ethnic Serbian, I should <coughs> say, um, resigned a few weeks ago, and uh, new elections for, for by-elections for these four mayorships have been called for 18th and 25th of December, um, although there are not so many candidates so far who have been nominated for, for running in these elections, and there is a real concern with, from a practical point of view, uh, with security in particular, because the Kosovo Serb police withdrew um, uh, resigned from, from, from the Kosovo uh, police force. We're talking about close to 600 police officers in, in total. So policing in northern Kosovo right now is ensured by about, uh, well, I'm not sure I should divulge exactly how many Kosovo Albanian police officers there are there, but between 40 and 50, I would say, regular police. Then there's some special border police at the crossing points between Kosovo and Serbia. Uh, we are there uh, monitoring the situation. We have increased our patrols. Uh, triple, we tripled our patrols over the past month. Um, we've been very visible, I must say, and it's been quite successful in terms of at least reassuring the local population and others that there is a presence there. But our mandate does not allow us to engage in, in, uh, in, in um, any kind of, of investigative work, arrests or so. We don't, don't, do not have a so-called executive mandate in, anymore in, in, uh, as a mission. We had that until 2018, both in the judiciary and in certain aspects as far as policing is concerned, related to the executive mandate in the judiciary that was changed. Um, although if you go back and look at when, when this mandate was handed over by the UN to, to the EU, to EU Lex in 2008, of course, that was a mandate based in large part on, <coughs> on, on, on UN Security Council resolution. Um, 1244, um, 1244 which regulates um, the, the um, shall we say the peace in, in, in Kosovo from, from, from 1999 onwards and is also the basis for the, for the NATO presence here. There's a, still a, also much reduced but still significant um, uh, NATO peacekeeping mission here that has special responsibility for a safe and secure environment in, in, in northern Kosovo. So this is a situation that literally is unfolding as we speak now since early November. These latest developments are due to um, the ongoing, still ongoing dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina uh, with the aim to, to finally try to settle the outstanding issues of conflict and the mutual recognition, uh, comprehensive normali or normalization at least uh, of relations between um, Kosovo and, and Serbia, and we see now how our role here and my role, although I'm less of a diplomat in this role as head of, 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 of mission, we don't only do policing, by the way, we still monitor the judiciary, we work with correctional services here, we work with forensics in terms of helping the authorities to identify missing persons from, 
from the wartime, in particular in the late 1990s. Uh, so we have, I would say, quite a, quite a, a broad mandate still, but as I said, um, not a specifically a, an executive mandate. What we do have is we have a sort of hybrid or quasi-executive role uh, in case of a specific request from the Kosovo police to support them, in particular in terms of crowd and riot control. So that's sort of the, the extreme end of the, of the scale. We, we do regular reconnaissance patrols in northern Kosovo especially, with or without um, kind of crisis and tensions that we've seen over the past month. And as I said, we've increased our presence there, our patrolling. We also started doing foot patrols. That's a decision I took as, as head of mission uh, two weeks ago to also get out of our vehicles to patrol in the urban areas. It's mostly one major city in northern Kosovo, Mitrovica, and then there are a handful of, of smaller, uh, smaller towns. Um, so we can and we have, we have this capability to engage in crowd, crowd and riot control, which is quite an extreme, at least for me as a non-police officer, uh, but not much in between this monitoring and patrolling and, and crowd and riot control. We cannot engage in regular police work, law, law, law enforcement, uh, nor can K4. So this is very much in the hands of the Kosovo police, but the Kosovo police, as I said, all the Kosovo Serb police officers include, starting with the director for the Northern District, um, resigned about three weeks ago. Um, uh, so uh, there is there's no very little official police. What we do see is that some of the Kosovo Serb police officers who have resigned seem to now um, unofficially be patrolling a bit. Uh, they've been offered, by the way, contracts by the municipal authorities there that I suppose are being paid for by, by, uh, by Belgrade. Um, and um, there have been these parallel structures all along over the past 10 years since the Kosovo Serb MUP police was integrated with the Kosovo, regular Kosovo police um, uh, some 10 years ago. Um, uh, this was part of the, the then dialogue uh, under the then high representative <coughs> Kathy Ashton um, and involving Belgrade and Pristina, uh, of course, and there. Also, the judiciary has withdrawn from, from northern Kosovo as well as, as I, as I mentioned, the mayors and some, some municipal um, workers. Now, maybe very briefly a word on Bosnia-Herzegovina, although I, I had little or nothing to do with the EU police mission there. I can understand there are, are <coughs> colleagues on the panel who have uh, direct experience from, from that mission. There was an EU police mission there. Um, for a number of years. Uh, I came there in 2015 as a special representative head of delegation. Um, of course, we're very much living with a, the with a legacy of, of Dayton, first of all, and the arrangements that were post-Dayton reached with, with a very fragmented police corps in, in the Federation entity in particular with 10 different <coughs> police um, corps in, in, in a sense because each canton and you have six, six cantons, as I recall, that are predominantly Bosniak and four that are Croat. In Republika Srpska, you have a more coherent system with one, one police force for all of Republika Srpska, um, which sometimes is a, is, a, is a concern, I think, in, in the Federation in Sarajevo that the Republika Srpska, the Serbian, ethnic Serbian Bosnian police seems more, more coherent. Um, it's a unique solution for, for Bosnia-Herzegovina, which I I think is, is, is particular for that, for that um, country. But on the other hand, there are plenty of, if, I, if my memory serves me right, also in the United States, you have different police in different states and, and so on, and they have slightly different rules of engagement and, and so on. So there's not one uniform police, police corps, and, and there are maybe other, other examples um, um, of that as well. Um, what I must say, just to, to, to conclude, um, is that um, our foreign police unit here, although right now we're talking about a total with this reserve that we have, as I mentioned, of some 135 police officers in an area, in a region that's quite large, but not very densely populated. Maybe a total population of um, 
northern Kosovo, maybe 50, 60,000 people in total, as I said, predominantly Serb, but there are pockets of Kosovo Albanians and a handful of other minorities in, in, in that part of, of, of Kosovo as well. So even if we did have a more robust mandate, uh, it would not be possible for us to really engage in, in um, a full-fledged uh, law enforcement uh, capacity. I think that would be it from my side. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, thank you so much for giving us um, a good overview of, of um, how things are looking from your perspective right now. And we wish you uh, good luck in, in responding to the evolving situation in, in northern Kosovo uh, right now. Um, when we will um, go into the question and answer, I think we'll be particularly interested in trying to figure out if there are one or two hard lessons or challenges that you're currently facing that uh, we should be taking into account in our discussion. But speaking of challenges and lessons learned, I wanted to then turn to Afghanistan and look at the case of, uh, of Afghanistan and ask um, John to uh, enlighten us a little bit about this, this specific context. And the reason why we, are, we were particularly interested in having John with us today is that he <laughs> released recently, I think it was in June, uh, earlier in June this year, uh, a report that was entitled Police in Conflict, Assessing the U.S. and International Efforts to Establish an Effective Civilian Police Force in Afghanistan. It is a very comprehensive report uh, that has a tremendous amount of rich and detailed information uh, at the experience um, in, in Afghanistan. So John, to the extent that you can, within uh, 15 minutes, um, present to all of us here the main insights and results of your report, we would be particularly grateful. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction and also for that uh, introduction to this report and for inviting me today. Um, the remarks uh, I give today are really based upon years of research conducted by my agency, uh, uh, which culminated in that report and we brought copies of it. It's available uh, on our website too, www.cigar.mil. Uh, that, along with 12 other lessons learned reports from Afghanistan, uh, which I, I highly recommend anybody who's doing any planning on working on reconstruction or redevelopment in a post-conflict environment. I think it behooves you uh, to read those reports because we have a 20 years of experience uh, on issues that I think are relevant to all of us as we uh, look forward. Uh, to other areas around the world. You know, in particular, the horrors taking place in the Ukraine uh, remind us how quickly stability can disappear in even the, uh, the most modern looking of countries. And experiences in places such as Afghanistan remind us how difficult it is to reconstruct a viable police force in the aftermath of military operations. I believe that we must use the lessons learned from our experience in Afghanistan in future endeavors to build police forces in post-conflict environments, whether it's the Ukraine, and Haiti, the Horn of Africa, or some conflict we haven't even thought of yet. For nearly 20 years, the United States and the international community provided assistance to Afghanistan's government with the goal of creating a legitimate, accountable, and effective civilian police force that could protect Afghans from criminals and terrorists alike. Without such a civilian law enforcement authority, as our report notes, the odds were greater that that country would remain unstable or revert to active conflict, which of course it did in Afghanistan. Yet, except for some specialized police forces, community policing and law enforcement capabilities in Afghanistan were weak or non-existent despite more than $21 billion with a B that was spent by the United States and the international community. 
Overall, the Afghan National Police, or ANP, proved incapable of enforcing the law, protecting Afghan citizens from criminals and attacks by the Taliban and Islamic State, or ensuring that Afghanistan did not become a haven for terrorism. And as we all saw live on TV, the ANP quickly collapsed following the US and NATO troop withdrawal. One of our critical findings is that the US and its international partners failed to fully understand the history of policing in Afghanistan, where the police, the, where, excuse me, has, there has never been an effective nationwide police force dedicated to protecting its citizens. Primarily, the police in Afghanistan have existed to protect the government power, often through corrupt or abusive means. In particular, the US and international community missed an opportunity in the early days following the invasion by ignoring the need to rapidly deploy police and rule of law advisors to stabilize what was at that time a post-conflict country. Now this was opposite to the approach taken in Kosovo just a few years earlier. Instead, the United States implemented what was called a light footprint strategy for maintaining a small troop presence and the international community followed suit. With the US focused on pursuing Al-Qaeda and Taliban sponsors, this allowed senior Afghan government officials and power brokers to seize the opportunity to reestablish a police force that was beholden to them and protecting their interests. As a result, for decades, the newly constituted Afghan police force operated with near total impunity. The Afghan government and the international community did not hold Afghan police officers, particularly those with political connections, accountable for numerous acts of corruption and human rights abuses. This rapidly, rapidly eroded any hope that the population had that the new Afghan government would serve their interests and the Taliban exploited that lack of trust for their benefit. By mid-2002, the international community belatedly recognized the depleted state of the Afghan police, and by 2003, the Department of State was given the responsibility for recreating a police force. Our report found out, found that, even though establishing law and order in a post-conflict environment is critical, the U.S. and international community unfortunately lack a deployable police assistance unit that has the required resources and required specialized expertise. Although by law, the State Department is the lead U.S. agency for police assistance, it does not have a dedicated team of deployable police development experts. Instead, in Afghanistan, it was forced to contract out the entire police assistance mission with little or no oversight. From the start, the program struggled, in no small part because the training program assumed that Afghanistan remained a post-conflict environment, and they had years to implement a professional police training program. The State Department also failed to embed experienced police advisors with newly trained officers to provide follow-up training in the field. Our report concluded that despite having the legal authority and the budget, the State Department was ill-prepared to operate in a high-threat environment like Afghanistan. Given the State Department's difficulties, the Defense Department successfully advocated to take over that role. And by 2005, it did so. But I, as I and my staff over the last 12 years have found, many times in Afghanistan, more resources did not lead to better results. Despite 
I would say one of the best reports I have seen on the subject, which was co-offered by the Institute of Peace in 2006, that concluded that the US military was ill-equipped in Iraq to train foreign police forces, our US military in Afghanistan quickly deployed advisors to partner with police forces and basically deployed units that were attached to the Afghan military to do so. Therefore, the US police assistance mission became, in essence, an extension of the military training mission. But just because the Defense Department had more personnel and more money did not mean that it had the right personnel to spend that money. Police mentoring teams continued to be staffed mostly by soldiers who lacked a basic understanding of law enforcement or community policing principles or even anything about criminal investigations. Rather, as you would expect, they had experience in infantry tactics, combat aviation, or other military specializations. Things were so bad that Sigar found helicopter pilots assigned to train the ANP. And actually, one instance, I think the Australians assigned submariners to help train the Afghan police. We also found US soldiers using videos of American TV crime dramas to, as training materials because they had no other materials to use to train the Afghan police, who for the most part were illiterate. Compounding matters, US police assistance prioritized rapidly increasing the quantity of police officers in the AMP over the quality and sustainability of police training. And all through this time, the Taliban insurgency grew stronger. As a response, the Defense Department leadership decided to focus the Afghan police to reflect US military counterinsurgency strategies. So instead of focusing on policing, most police units focused on security and support to military operations. They became the, the little brother to the Afghan National Army. The Afghan police, therefore, failed to develop the basic law enforcement capabilities required to pre prevent and respond to criminal activities that were plaguing Afghan citizens and growing at that time. This, in turn, undermined what legitimacy the central government may have had and turned those Afghan citizens in many communities to the Taliban or to tribal justice for security and for justice. The widespread use of illegal detention and torture of suspected insurgents, for example, also led many of these communities to welcome back the Taliban as liberators. And I may add, this highlights a dilemma, I think, that US advisors, the US and the international community have in general. And that is, was cooperation with brutal, brutal but militarily capable security forces worthwhile if it restored security? Or did that cooperation create more conflict in the long run in Afghanistan? And we don't answer that, but that is a, a, an obvious question uh, that we need to address. Now, the collapse of the Afghan government and security forces highlights, I think, the importance of creating an effective police service in post-conflict and fragile states. And that's the bottom line of our report. But let me conclude with just two key findings before I, I conclude my presentation here today, and I hope it's developed in the questioning. The first is that the US, donor, US and donor community lack an expeditionary police assistance capability with police assistance experts required for, the, for most of the stabilization and reconstruction missions that we face around the world. Foreign police assistance is often a civilian-led task, 
But as we saw in Afghanistan, and to some extent what we're seeing in Kosovo, civilian agencies lack the force protection and mobility to operate in areas of significant violence, and also lack usually the experts who can be rapidly deployed. This result in the, is, this results, as it did in Afghanistan, in usually the military stepping in. Yet militaries usually lack the technical expertise to develop a civilian police force and associated ministries. And since military advisors are likely to train the police on what they know best, this increases the risk of severely militarizing the police. Our report notes that the United States should consider using its relationship with allies who have unique assistance capabilities, such as Italy and the, and the internationally respected Carbonieri, as well as many other organizations or police forces in Europe that have military status as well as law enforcement status, the gendarmerie that was referred to by the ambassador. The second key lesson I want to leave you with is that pre-deployment training and education for police advisors must include an understanding of the nation's legal traditions, its historical relationship between the police and the population, the extent of police corruption, the command and control organizations, the rule, how it's tied into the other ministries to succeed. This knowledge will help advisors avoid interjecting police concepts that may run counter to the host nation's criminal justice system. As, for example, when U.S. advisors try to import common law concepts to Afghanistan, where the legal system has historically been based upon civil law traditions intertwined with religious and other uh, traditions. If in the future, police advising efforts uh, should succeed and hopefully get a better outcome than what we saw in Afghanistan, policymakers must learn from our 20 year experience there and make those hard choices necessary to invest police assistance and undertake necessary reforms. I'm reminded of something said by somebody far smarter than me and far um, many years ago, Ben Franklin, who said, failure to plan is planning to fail. And I think our 20 year experience teaches us all that Afghanistan is in essence um, an example of what happens when we fail to plan, when we fail to utilize the lessons learned by the Institute of Peace even, when they looked at Iraq, or by some of the other lessons learned by our experience, I think, in the Baltic, uh, 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 the, uh, in, in Kosovo and other countries. So I urge everyone to, if you're a policymaker who's looking at what we should do in Ukraine, or what we should do in Haiti, I highly recommend you go back and study what we learned in Afghanistan. Thank you. John, many thanks for, um, for your comments and this candid evaluation of, of, of the challenges, but also the, the hard lessons that were learned in, in Afghanistan. What I think um, I noted during your presentation is that this is almost a perfect segue to, um, to Giuseppe's presentation, because one of your lessons is that there is a lack uh, of capabilities that can be easily deployed in order to ensure that there are effective policing services that are being provided on the ground. And so we wanted to turn, into, uh, turn to the second part of the event, which is to start looking at the models that have been developed uh, in, in this case, I think John was pointing to a lack of national capabilities, but also John's remarks pointed to the need to, for the United States and other governments to partner with nations that might have, and allied nations that might have, useful capabilities to be able to deploy. And so in that context, I wanted to turn to uh, Giuseppe and ask <coughs> Giuseppe to 
Um, talk about the models that have been developed at NATO, and you're particularly well positioned to, to address this. Um, that might help address some of the lessons that uh, John and his team's reports have highlighted with the experience in Afghanistan. So to the extent that you can um, cover some of those uh, models that have been developed uh, by NATO <clears throat> in relation to the security gap and stability policing, uh, I think that would be particularly appreciated by, by the participants and the panelists too. Jacific? First and foremost, uh, thank you for having me here. And uh, let me brag about being part of uh, Mr. Sopko's team uh, since the Center of Excellence for Stability uh, Policing uh, uh, cooperated uh, since uh, November 2019, have been cooperating with, uh, has been cooperating with the uh, CIGAR. So uh, yet, right yesterday, we signed an extension of our cooperation agreement until 2024. Uh, so with that said, let me start with some questions to the, to the audience. Just to quote a great friend of mine, Mrs. Hosna Jalil, a former Deputy Minister of Interior in Afghanistan. Did you know that in Afghanistan, 150% more was the percentage of the fatalities amongst the civilians for crime-related action rather than terrorism-related actions? Did you know that the Afghan National Police was almost entirely devoted to counterinsurgency, counterterrorism operations, just the 15%, 15% of the INP was devoted to community-oriented policing to fill the very gap the ambassador mentioned before. Who was going to fill this gap then? Going back to Bosnia Herzegovina, you may remember Sir Paddy Ashdown, the United Nations Special Envoy for Bosnia Herzegovina and BIH, he said the international community may have done, made that mistake since criminal posed the greatest threat to stability in, Bo in BIH. Yet, instead of having posing the priority to the rule of law, I mean, the problem was the political problem. So the priority was put on early elections without taking care of stability, without taking care of the rule of law. So it's like, you no, know, using that terms, which is pretty familiar for me since I've been in the law enforcement for my whole life, putting aside all the crime related issues back in my country, I look only on mafia related issues. And what about the wall that blew up in that village, in a, no? in a remote area in a, close to Herat, only because the coalition built another wall to support the local population? By doing so, they move part of the revenues of this wall from the local chieftain, who will run a very small well, to those who were running the well. And Really, yesterday I was told by a very seasoned practitioner that uh, it was a, a wrong choice building a second well because we took money from that local chieftain, so we destabilized the area. No, I, my, my reply was, this is mafia. So we must fill this vacuum. I mean, another finding which comes from uh, my great friend James Cunningham, former CIGAR project leader, of the police in conflict report is a, a finding from Rand Corporation. After the Second World War, did you know that uh, half of the countries which experienced civil war revolt back to their situation within five years? One fifth of these countries revolt to the previous situation within one year. The record is Afghanistan, nine days. So law enforcement, it is not a NATO task. Too often, though, NATO is called to step in because nobody else does it. No actors are taking the stage at this point. So NATO, which is a political military alliance, which has got expeditionary forces, is to step in. And so as it happened, the result support is also to take care of all those issues relevant to the capacity building piece for policing. 
but there are also gendarmerie type forces which can support this endeavor. Yet, what is stability policing according to NATO? We have to talk about police related activity aimed either or temporarily replacing the local police in a fragile state or reinforcing these policies in order to uphold the rule of law. So one of the stalls, the, the three legs of the stall, no, the rule of law, cops, courts, and correction, which must be addressed simultaneously, public order security, and then the protection, upholding human rights, which is a huge basket according to NATO doctrine, which encompasses an awful lot of cross-cutting topics, but we'll talk a little about it later. So, as you can see, the center of gravity of stability policing activities is the population and the law enforcement of the, 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 of the host nation. As I said, through stability policing, uh, NATO addresses multiple threats, somehow precluded to the combat forces of the alliance. Think about any form of crimes. Think about no kinetic operation of ter related to terrorism. Ultimately, you cannot chase a rubber with a tank, but you can do so with police means. Going back to history, when we talk about the security gap, uh, is, uh, everything started in Bosnia Herzegovina in August 1998, when the forefather of stability policing was deployed, the multinational specialized unit, because there was an issue. It was not possible to implement the Dayton Agreement. So through the Peace Implementation Council, after the Bonn Conference in 1997, in December 1997, it was decided to make things happen, to implement the Dayton Agreement. So to address the spoilers of the peace process, which my great friend, Mike Gigic, always talk about, which undermine the end state of the mission, because they do spoil the mission from the scratch, from the fundament. And by doing so, they prevent the alliance to achieve their end state. Ultimately, the military address the enemies. The police address the adversaries of the alliance. That said, let me talk one second about the actors who can perform stability policing according to NATO. There are multiple actors. The first logical choice, according to NATO doctrine, are the gendarmerie type forces. There is now a NATO agreed term, which took, I mean, took two years to agree with this term, about gendarmerie type forces. We are talking about armed forces, fully interoperable with the military, part of the military instrument of power, integral part. So we are not paramilitary. We are inside the military. We have the same structure, the same organization, the same ranks which performs back in their country policing towards the civil population. They can do so also in a fragile state when they are deployed, thanks to their robust assets. So in a nutshell, as General Mike Jackson, the first commanding general from the UK in, Bos in Kosovo said, we are talking just about soldiers with the mind of policemen. So what is stability policing in a nutshell? It's just bringing the police dimension into military operations. Current, post, previous conflicts are very complex. There are, we must address challenges and threats which are very different and sometimes, sometimes intertwined, like the asymmetric threats. We have to address threats in the gray zone, challenges in the gray zone that cannot be achieved by the military instrument of power. It cannot be rich. The actors, the first logical choice, as I mentioned, are the gendarmerie type forces. However, also the traditional military police, those who carry out combat support operation can be part of this club. The military themselves, but also in a permissive environment, also civil police or contractors. When across the the full spectrum of NATO operations. So across the four operational teams, and most importantly, stability policing activities 
can be performed in the three NATO course tasks, collective defense, which is now in a more proactive fashion defined after the, the, um, uh, the Madrid summit in June, late last June, is, a, is not anymore cooperative defense, but is a, is a defense and deterrence, crisis prevention operation, and crisis prevention and management of operation, non-Article 5 operation, and co cooperative security. These are the three main core tasks of NATO. And so, in a really, in a nutshell, stability policing is just shifting the gendarmerie type forces model overseas in operations, in fragile states. But when you think about a fragile state, think about a country which is war torn, think about a country which was wiped away, all its institutions, by a tsunami. You can name it as a war, or you can name it like a man made disaster or a natural disaster. This is it. So it's important to note that the core business of stability policing, according to NATO doctrine, is the civil population and the host nation police, when we are especially in a, in a uh, uh, reinforcing mission. So either we replace the police or we sustain their endeavor in order to build their capacities. Time is flying, so let me draw to an end. The end state of stability policing for sure is a, a very quick empowerment of the local law enforcement. The soonest we, we transfer the authority, the better. Stabi through stability policing, the Alliance consolidates its gains, focusing on that gap that nobody else addresses unless we leave the floor, the ground, the, the battlefield to our enemies and adversaries. However, let me say that robust policing requires a robust, a robust legal framework, not the light footprint approach to echo Inspector General Sobko. So that concludes my briefing, pending your questions. Giuseppe, many thanks uh, for, the, for this overview of the, the models and the, that are currently being developed by NATO, not being developed, but also part of NATO doctrine, thanks to the work done by you and, and your team. Which then uh, makes me want to go to um, the United Nations and try to uh, assess uh, as well the models that uh, are currently being developed or the frameworks or the tools that the United Nations have also been developing uh, as these lessons have started emerging from the context that we've talked about. Uh, so just want to the extent that you, you, you'd be uh, willing to, to share with us, um, what, how does the UN Police Division is approaching policing in conflict-affected settings generally? And what are the frameworks and the tools that are considered as well at the UN level? So to, uh, feel free to take the podium and, and, and share with you, uh, with us and the audience uh, uh, a few thoughts. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to USIP uh, for inviting me uh, uh, to be together with such esteemed colleagues uh, uh, to talk about policing. I do not wish to stand here and offer the real right solutions, but what we are doing within the United Nations. So, uh, basically, as a brief, <coughs> excuse me, United Nations does not have an entire unit that it deploys. So, basically, we are left at the uh, mercy of the 193 member states that we have got, out of which we have got. Uh, 80 police contributing countries who deploy police officers to the field um, where we are mandated to operate. And more recently, uh, uh, until recent times, we were just sending our police officers to peacekeeping operations, special political missions. Now we are able to send police officers to non-mission settings, which is anywhere around the globe. So, 
our policing started with the United Nations in 1960s where we used to provide humanitarian assistance and monitoring only. The mandates, the complexity of tasks have grown from that to uh, monitoring, interim law enforcement, training and mentoring, advising, operation support, uh, reform, restructuring and rebuilding, uh, law enforcement capacity building and development, and security sector uh, uh, reform, post-conflict development. So basically, we have gone onto all the gamut of the whole policing and law enforcement areas. In uh, between 1995 and 2002, we served in Bosnia Herzegovina. One of the critical aims in Bosnia Herzegovina was to enable the police officers to be able to serve in UN peacekeeping operations, and which we do now. We have got over 36 police officers in uh, South Sudan and Cyprus. Now, how do we do policing in post-conflict situation? Post-conflict situations are a bit of a moving target for us. So you've got 100% heat where there is active conflict, and that is probably the worst place for police to be involved. And uh, because you cannot do policing, or we cannot do policing. So when it comes to about 70% heat, uh, that's where policing tends to uh, increase its intensity. That's where United Nations police are most effectively deployed. Now, when we look at post-conflict policing, we had to go back within ourselves to ask our questions, what are the lessons of our deployment, our 40 years of deployment that we have learned? Firstly, we didn't have any uh, doctrine or guidance. Even though the UN General Assembly had asked uh, back in 1994 uh, for, for the police to have a standardized guidance, we were still lacking that. So well, what we attempted to do beginning in 2008, 2009, was develop what is now known internationally recognized, when I, when I say internationally recognized, I mean 193 member states together with the uh, other actors, and through the United Nations Security Council uh, resolutions, three resolutions out of it, which is known as the Strategic Guidance Framework. So basically that provided us with the doctrine to base our policing efforts on. Now, a strategic guidance framework doesn't answer the nitty gritties of undertaking uh, capacity building and development or operations in specific niche areas. It provides a basic bronze standard so that there, there are parameters that we, we operate with, so that whatever we deliver is responsive, responsible, and representative of the population that we serve. When we were uh, the developing the strategic guidance framework, we found there were four challenges. In fact, three. Right? One was the growth in demand for policing services or policing interventions worldwide. The second one was the complexity of the task that we were, the international community were asked to deliver when we were doing our interventions. And the third and most important was the lack of capability within the donor or the, or the uh, contributing state to the state in conflict, which led us to desire go back to the drawing board and find the knowledge and capacity and doctrine gap. And this is the purpose for which the strategic guidance framework was developed. It was developed to provide a certain level of a certain level of answers to 
enable the contributing states to provide the right people in the right quantity at the right time to enable the right results. Because we were finding that we were uh, getting lessons from everywhere, but this was not being uh, coagulated and synthesized and learned in a manner that could provide a bronze sort of metal. And I will always insist, this is a bronze sort of metal. All, pol uh, all countries have got internal security forces or law enforcement agencies. Not all countries have got policing services. And that is the key word, because policing is about policing for the people, for the individuals in the country, rather than policing for the government. And that's, where, that's the foundation of our strategic guidance framework. Now, within the strategic guidance framework, there are four, four basically pillars. One is the operations, command, administration, and the last but most important is the capacity building and development pillar. What we insist within the capacity building and development pillar is there are five areas that uh, interventions need to address to be successful. And this is after studies with the member states, uh, I mean contributions from, uh, from the man member states, from institutions, from uh, uh, Interpol, and uh, other organizations. Those five areas are support to the policing services, the actual policing services, support to the enabling services, that is they need to have enough budget to enable the services to be delivered. There needs to be a framework for the operations, for the host state police to, uh, for the operation. The fourth one is the accountability and governance within the police service. So they need, uh, they need to be uh, accountable. And the fifth one is the local ownership engagement, which is the stakeholder engagement. Those who are involved in the policing within a country need to be engaged while we are developing the capacity of the whole state police and law enforcement agencies. Um, and basically we found that once these were able to be delivered, we were able to build the capacity of the whole state police that was able to deliver sustainable policing through the thick and thin of times. Because we, we believe that uh, policing and law enforcement and, uh, is a central chain of the uh, security sector as well as criminal justice chain. It is, it is the uh, nexus, it provides the nexus between security sector reform and the criminal justice, because uh, that's where the, the commonality lies. And we believe that the development of the whole state police is um, critical so, uh, to have the development and the economic development of the country. Now, with the, uh, the, uh, that intervention, uh, I'd like to uh, leave the time for questions. Thank you very much. Appreciate your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Jaswan, many thanks. Feel free to come back and uh, sit, sit down so that we can now address a number of questions from, from the audience, both online but also uh, our audience in person. Uh, so I wanted to turn to the audience here first to see if there are any questions for our panelists uh, today. Yes. And if I may ask uh, members of the audience to uh, introduce themselves and then uh, lead with a very quick, crisp question, uh, please. Thank you very much, Lee. Mike Jage, he's formerly a senior program officer here at USIP and currently at George Mason University. I want to begin by applauding USIP for addressing this issue and for having an all-star cast with us to uh, identify the lessons that we need to learn. And um, my concern about this is that these are not new lessons. We've known for 20 years that there's a public security gap. And we, we currently 
failed to address it appropriately. And more recently, uh, we've identified that assessments, which have been ident identified as a critical question, assessments of corruption, assessments of potential spoilers, are essential. So I th my questions uh, have to do with that, and for uh, Colonel De Magistris Giuseppe, my dear friend. Um, NATO has taken on this issue, uh, and I think it was about four years ago that Allied Command Transformation provided to NATO a stability policing concept. What, what and could you uh, describe for us what the status of that is and what the issues are that need to be overcome so that it can be adopted? Uh, because we have heard, we, desperate, we the U.S., not just peace and stability ops, but the U.S. really lacks this capability. And as far as assessments, and that's, I, I think, uh, a question for our, our colleague from the uh, UN Police Division, I believe. You mentioned the uh, strategic guidance framework, which Stefan Feller developed. And in that guidance framework, it talks about UN policing being used, and he specifically talks about spoilers and the police role in that. But the conundrum we face, and it's and the unspoken, well, uh, Giuseppe, I think, mentioned it, or at least alluded to it, the police and the government that they work for, if you will, are part of the problem rather than the solution. So is there any UN assessment, not just of capability, but of the corruption risk, the spoiler risk that the UN uh, would is like, in fact, not as likely, 70% of the time in my own work, 70% of the post-Cold War two, I'm sorry, post-Cold War um, missions have had spoilers. So uh, assessment is, is a critical issue as you've, your speakers have identified. Thank you very much. I think in there, there's a question for NATO uh, that I will ask Giuseppe to, to tackle. And then there is also a question I think for Jaswan to, to answer. So uh, maybe Giuseppe, you can go first and then we can turn to Jaswan. To, yeah. First and foremost, a disclaimer. I am the director of the NATO Stability Policy Center of Excellence, which is neither part of the NATO command structure nor part of the NATO force structure. So I do not speak on behalf of NATO, but I'm as my capacity as of the director. The concept, the strategic concept on stability policing is still on, uh, on its way. Now it's in, on the hands of uh, the international military staff. They will soon uh, retask ACT, Allied Command Transformation, to uh, address several challenges within the concept itself. So it has not been approved, it has not been approved yet. Which are the criticalities? Uh, I would say really uh, in a nutshell, they are relevant to the misconception, the misunderstanding on the actors and the function. Stability is, policing is a function, not only for the gendarmes, but is open also to the open club that I mentioned. Is open also to the other actors in the team of operation. Military police, the traditional ones, those who co provide support to the force in their combat support fashion, I mean, for protection, mobility support, detainees, and policing discipline for the force are part of this club. They can join. However, they will do, they will uh, discharge policing duties, not military policing duties. So this is the somehow the misunderstanding because there is a, there is a confusion, confusion between the actors and the function itself. However, also the military can be part of the open club. Think about patrolling uh, uh, the, uh, a lake or a riverine area, I mean, you do need robust patrolling through maybe the Marine Corps. And the same applies in a permissive environment, as I mentioned, to the civil police, which can be part of this open club, because we do need instructors. And uh, as it was said also in the, in the SIGA report, there is no country across the world which has got both the capacities, the capacity and the capability to express such niche skills. So only by moving forward in unison, we will be able to, to make the difference. Uh, thanks for, to, to you for the mention to the spoilers. 
once again, the spoilers can be identified through policing means, not only through intelligence means. You do need also investigation capabilities. However, you do require this robust uh, legal framework that empowers the robust policing to be deployed in any theater of operations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Giuseppe. Thank you, uh, Giuseppe. And, and I think in addition to uh, the legal frameworks and the, investi the investigative capabilities, I think the question that Michael was addressing here was also the need to be relying on strong, though rigorous assessments of the situation on the ground so that we can identify. And I think Jasmine and Michael's discussion um, uh, as, as part of assessments and <clears throat> the, the importance and the role of assessments within the UN set of tools and frameworks, I think that's what uh, Michael's questions was also referring to. So Jasmine, do you have a few thoughts or to share with, uh, with, with Michael? Thank you, Mark. Well, I mean, uh, personally, I mean, uh, in my previous life, I was a planning officer. So uh, I, I essentially believe, and it is all part of uh, whenever we deploy UN police to the field, prior to any deployment, we do an assessment uh, and evaluation of the current capacities within the ground. And that is very critical because we cannot provide any intervention without assessing what is already there because we do not intend to replace any of the services that are there. So I think uh, we, that is a basic requirement for our terms of reference for any deployment. We do a, a, a in uh, in-country ca uh, capability assessment, capability and capacities assessment, because that will determine the type of intervention, uh, the type of support that we can provide uh, uh, to the whole state. Yeah. Great. M Michael, hold on to the follow-on question. Uh, uh, well, uh, okay. Okay, just hold on to the follow-on question, because I wanted to make sure that we also tackle uh, an important question with uh, uh, with John first, and then we'll turn uh, to, to EU Lex and Kosovo. The question I had with John is, I think what was very clear in the various discussions today and the examples that we saw is that there is, uh, there is a transition in place where at the very beginning, when <clears throat> at the end of armed conflict, you may have uh, an international mandate, a multilateral or a national force present that could deploy uh, some, some capacity and capabilities to help address these security challenges. But then after that, there is a transition where ultimately, and I think uh, legitimately, there is an expectation that these policing services will be implemented by effective, legitimate, local police services on the ground. My question to John uh, is, I think Afghanistan has shown us how difficult this transition has proven to be, how difficult it is to move from the provision of international capacities uh, or, or means or resources to building that capacity. So I wanted to ask <clears throat> John first, if there are a number of lessons, and you've highlighted some of them, what would be the two or three most important lessons, according to you, that the US has to start operationalizing today uh, so that these transitions can be better anticipated and better implemented? Well, I, I think that's a very good question. Thank you for it. I, I think the first thing is you have to realize that that period can be very brief. And I think our report highlights a study done by the UN. I think it's talking about in a, a matter of weeks, you need to get somebody out there and start working. So, uh, because then you, you, you lose it. Uh, the population realizes they're not being helped, and then uh, the bad guys come back. And it's not just the terrorists, it can be the corrupt officials, it can be the warlords, it can be the oligarchs or whatever. So we're talking about a matter of weeks, of months. You need to get somebody on the ground. At that point, it's relatively safe for civilian advisors to get out there. But you need civilian advisors who actually know how to advise police. And what we saw with the State Department, when they put their advisors, they just contracted it out to somebody. And of course, when you contract it out, 
it takes months to get it on contract. So, you know, nine months or a year later, you get contractors coming in, and there was really no oversight. So you need people who have that capability. That's why we talk in terms of this niche capability that the Carbonieri have, that the gendarmerie, we have somebody here representing a Romanian gendarmerie. You have these people who know, who are highly trained as police officers, and in their home countries, they act as police officers, but they also have that law, not a law enforcement, but almost a quasi-military capability. They know how to operate in dangerous environments. And that's why I think there's been much talk about that, and that's why we, we cooperated with the Carabinieri in working on this report, was because they offered a sort of a, you know, a, a, a capability to come in beyond the 12 weeks or 20 weeks and to do that. But realizing that the Carabinieri and the Gendarmerie, whether they're Spanish, Romanian, or the uh, Carabinieri, they have law enforcement authorities back and responsibilities back home. And as uh, uh, Giuseppe told me yesterday, I mean, if you pull out a thousand Carabinieri, you got a, a hole in the Italian police force. So nobody, nobody right now has that capability to send in a thousand or eight hundred uh, uh, gendarmerie. Uh, for a long period of time. They may be able to do it for a short period of time, but it's not going to work. And this is why they open club masters. <laughs> yes. 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 This is why they open club masters. To kickstart design because and because lay the foundation. Provide the bulk, but yeah. then all the others can join in. Mm -hmm. Can I just add one other thing, which I, I didn't really mention too much in my presentation, but we discuss it in a report. And I go back, you call it the spoilers, uh, Giuseppe. But uh, it, it, I think it was Ambassador Ryan Crocker, who's a very famous ambassador in the United States. He was ambassador in Afghanistan as well as in Iraq, and I think he's spoken here many times. You know, he said early on, and he was the first ambassador I worked with, that the, the, the main threat in Afghanistan was never the terrorists. It was corruption. And that was the spoiler. And he comments about how we ignored that. And, and that's what it was with the policing. We ignored that the corrupt elements came back mm -hmm. and basically, you know, spoiled the soup. So, and so that, uh, so thanks, thanks for, 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 for this, uh, I, I wanted them to move to a question to Ambassador uh, Vigoma, because if we think of this idea of a transition and making sure we start on the right footing, which I think is the point we were discussing. If we look at the case of Kosovo, uh, when Ambassador Vigoma went to uh, and started his work at EULEX, he found a very different setting. He found himself at a much, a, a much further um, in this transition process, where at the beginning in 2008, on their, and within the framework of Security Council Resolution 1244, EULEX deploys, has a significant amount of executive mandate responsibilities, as people on the ground will, will refer to, but provide uh, and help and support uh, operationally a number of police operations. But, uh, moving forward uh, 12 years after that, uh, as he has described to us, EULEX is now in a different position where the Kosovo police services uh, has emerged as a functioning institution, uh, is providing, is the first responder to address these challenges, and the mission has adapted to be uh, monitoring a lot of these activities, providing operational support in specific, uh, under specific circumstances at the request of the Kosovo Police Services. So my question to Ambassador Vigermach is even when we are much further in this transition and we've, we've, we've uh, landed in a position which I think many people in other contexts would, 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 would dream to find themselves in, uh, what are the challenges that you're seeing from your vintage point today uh, even in a situation where um, things have moved on and the local capacities to provide policing services have dramatically improved. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. And thank you for also for, for uh, very eloquently describing the, the situation here as it, as it stands today. Um, and I would say, first of all, I'm trying to, to reply to your <coughs> your specific questions, that many of the comments, in particular from John Sopke, 
um, I think are still very relevant also for this situation. First of all, um, yes, indeed, our mandate has evolved here in response to, I think, in general, positive developments in Kosovo. They do have their own police force now that was established. I think it's a fairly credible police force that enjoys support by most of the local population, at least the Kosovo Albanian population. The problem is in northern Kosovo uh, right now, and that's not a new problem, where the Kosovo Serb police was integrated with the Kosovo, shall we say, Albanian police from Pristina and other parts of Kosovo. But that integration was never fully completed. And here I think we as international community, European Union, US, whoever you may want to pick, um, I wouldn't say we have failed because these things take time. Um, but uh, the Kosovo Serb police was never fully integrated in spirit, if I can put it that way. There was still a, somehow a bit of a difference. But, but they were, the, the ethnic Serbs, also in northern Kosovo and in other parts. There are predominantly Serbian enclaves uh, throughout Kosovo, also in the, in, in, in the southern part. In fact, the majority of, of ethnic Serbs live south of, of the Ibar. Um, and they are integrated into the structures, but there are also still this phenomenon of so-called parallel structures. I will not go into that now in, in detail in, in, in the interest of, of time. But the risk now is that the Kosovo Serbs police officers in particular, but also judiciary and others who have now resigned um, about a month ago, that they uh, will not return, that they will instead um, assume a kind of unofficial role in a parallel system and eventually that system will morph with again the Serbian system and then we have well I don't want to say the word out here loud in, 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 a, in a public forum but I think you can all put two and two together so while we have moved ahead why I say we why Kosovo has moved ahead and I'd like to think also the region uh, moved ahead this this, this risk uh, is still there, and we see just over the past several months, because these tensions, as I said, came to a boil about a month ago, and just today we had some incidents with election officials from Pristina going to the four northern uh, most municipalities to start preparations for local elections in, to replace the local mayors who, who withdrew. They were sort of pushed back, shall we say. Nobody was, was, was injured from the reports we have. We're there monitoring the situation. Um, <clears throat> but I'd like to come back to the general, not to focus too much here now on the specifics in Kosovo. I fully agree with, with the previous speakers about the need for some sort of expeditionary force. Um, in the European Union, we have this European Gendarmerie Force which is not an EU body per se, officially speaking, but consists of EU member states that have this gendarmerie capability, including, but not excluding, um, excluded to, to Italy, France, also Romania was mentioned, Slovakia, um, Poland has it. We have, have Polish police here, but they also have a kind of gendarmerie, like the Netherlands actually have a gendarmerie, Spain, Portugal also have. Uh, now, there are various political reasons why I think it's unlikely that certain of, of our member states would deploy here. <clears throat> we have the Carabinieri here, and we're, we're very grateful. But as was, I think, said um, very well by, by, by John Sopke, even um, countries, or call them donors, uh, whatever, um, such as France or Italy, that have very large gendarmerie, forces uh, mounting about 100,000 or, or more, and, and uh, for them to, to deploy more than one or two platoons is, is unlikely, if I can put it that way, uh, from everything I understand. Um, we have our own capacity here, by the way, to deploy within eight minutes, but only one, <laughs> one platoon for crowd and riot control and maybe a second one for backup. So our capacity on the ground is, is very limited. I also fully agree with the observation that there are times when you really need to do this and what we're talking about is different segments in terms of timing. Timing is everything. Um, and the first sort of instance, the first example, and having served in Afghanistan 20 years ago as one of the first sort of EU, EU uh, representatives uh, there starting in January um, 2002, 
I think the need for policing was there from day one. Uh, and I can recall the EU set up a police um, training mission there, but it took quite some time. Germany had a particular, there was a kind of tasking within the international community, but Germany took on the role of, of uh, training the new Afghan police and so on. Um, uh, I sort of lost track of it after, um, after that. But I think there are lessons here uh, to be learned for um, that are not unique to any one, one theater or, 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 or uh, conflict. And that is with relatively limited means. We saw here over the past month or so how by simply increase, increasing our patrolling, we could fill part of this gap. But we cannot fill it for, for an extended period of time. And as I said, our mandate it also, is also limited. And I fully agree with what John and others refer to, that military is not meant to do policing. The difference between green and blue boots is, is a real one. There may be situations where, uh, shall we say, a tougher and more robust uh, military style of policing is, is necessary. Uh, but for most instances, we're talking about local community policing. And I'm myself now, without going into too many details, considering whether, because we have this highly trained, very capable crowd and riot control uh, force here, predominantly, I have a handful of police advising near police. I would like to have a few more police advisors who could just be on the ground, ideally speaking local language, or they have to at least have, as was also pointed out, an understanding of what's going on. I have a Slovenian senior police officer who just deployed this summer. He speaks Serbian. He's now in, 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 um, in northern Kosovo. Uh, he and his colleagues, but there are too few of them, I would argue. And I made the same reflection, actually, <laughs> 30 years ago uh, when I was for my first posting in Belgrade. And I remember meeting two Swedish police officers who were working for the OSE that, at least until recently, was another actor in this, this, this field. Um, and they were part of a small group of about 40 police officers deployed uh, under an OSE umbrella in Bosnia-Herzegovina. We're talking early 1992 now, so before the conflict erupted in April. And they were saying, look, if there were 400 of us and we were deployed across Bosnia in local communities, because what they were doing, they, were, they went around talking to local villagers, local communities, where sometimes you had an old conflict between neighbors over over land or a family feud or maybe a tree that was growing on the wrong side of, of, of the fence and which unfortunately then deteriorated into to, to bloodshed once the, 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 the conflict um, uh, erupted. So to have this sort of bottom-up approach, I think we tend to come in with, uh, you know, it's good to send in the Marines uh, at a certain point, but, but you also need to have uh, <laughs> other softer tools to use. Um, and I think that's the purpose of this, this, um, uh, this discussion. Um, and um, I'm in very close contact here with, with, uh, with NATO colleagues, with the force commander for K4, who's Italian, by the way. And he was very helpful in, in making sure that the, the Carabinieri that we, we now had asked for arrived on time by contacting his, his counterpart in Rome, because they have a sort of civil mill coordination there, and, and he himself was a former force commander in Kosovo, so he understood the need to act quickly. So we, they did deploy very quickly, but I can tell you we had started preparations for this deployment already back in, in, in August when we had the last incidents here, and we saw the need for a reinforcement. I would gladly have more, uh, more of a reserve um, here, but it's not all about numbers. Uh, and the confidence building and the conflict prevention aspect of all of this is, is essential. But here again, timing is essential. You can't wait for months, for years to deploy police or start to train. This is a long-term effort combination, but we need to look at this as a sequence of, of different actions um, from the policing point of view. For, um for your remarks. Uh, I think that's all the time we have. Uh, but I wanted to thank, to turn to the panelists and thank them uh, really uh, sincerely for taking the time to come here at USAP and talk about these important technical um, 
and host these important technical discussions. Very often questions of policing, security gaps, the kind of things that we've talked about today can be seen as highly technical, theoretical, but as we've seen in the case of Afghanistan, as we've seen in the case of Kosovo even today, these are very practical and they're crucial. And the, the policing and effective policing is a crucial vector of any effort to, to build a sustainable peace. So I wanted to thank everyone uh, today in the audience, people online, for, for joining us for this important conversation. As I've mentioned, this is the first of a series of events that we will be hosting at USIP in the upcoming years. So thank you for joining us today, and I want everyone to extend uh, a warm thank you to all our panelists here today uh, with me. So thank you very much. Yeah.